Okay, well, um, my name is Bud Triple, and uh, I work at Apple Computer. I'm going to sort of take off um, where John left off uh, and uh, talk about Mac software. It's really hard to talk about history, especially um, if you've been involved, because what you're really getting is one single perspective on, on what happened. But I think that's actually useful in some cases, as long as you understand that's where it's coming from. So I'm going to give my uh, particular perspective on a lot of things. Um, also mentioned that uh, it was striking during the last talk, which was all about the, the culture and the people. And I really believe uh, that the culture and the people are the most interesting part of the story. And um, you know, a century from now, the technology part of it will be you know, taken for granted by everyone. And a lot of the technology already is taken for granted. Uh, but the interesting part that will remain will be the stories and the culture and the people uh, that happened at that time. Uh, it reminds me of a book I just read called, I think it was called Longitude, about the chronograph. And of course, we all take watches for granted, but the, the people stories and, and uh, the cultural uh, lessons you can learn from it are, are the interesting part. At any rate, I'll, I will also spend a lot of my time talking about uh, the technology and its, how it impinged on the culture and vice versa. Um, just a quick, uh, 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 you know, how did I get get uh, involved in this this story of the personal computer and the Macintosh? Um, I was I uh, grew up in the in the 60s and the 70s. I went to uh, college at UC San Diego and uh, um, got very involved in computers during that time. I'll talk a little bit about that uh, with a, a good friend of mine called Bill Atkinson, who ultimately went to Apple and talked me into going to Apple, um, although at the time I was in an MD-PhD program at the University of Washington. And um, I took some time off to go to Apple, and uh, what I did there was to become the, the original manager of the Macintosh software project in 1980, which was um, just getting off the ground and under, under a fellow named Jeff Raskin, uh, who I had met earlier at UCSD. And um, uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, you know, some of what, what went on in those early days and, and sort of what our thinking was about some of the design decisions. And I think, um, I think that'll, be, that'll be interesting. Um, after uh, being at Apple uh, for a while, going back to school, finishing my medical degree and PhD, and coming back to Apple in 85, um, I left along with a number of other people to found a company called Next Computer with Steve Jobs. And so the next thing I'll talk about is, is uh, Next Step and the software we did there, because it turns out that ultimately that company was merged back into Apple, and a lot of the technology that came out of Next and Next Step um, became what uh, is known today as the Macintosh operating system or Mac OS X. So those, those three um, threads are kind of represented here, and uh, I'll go into some detail on them. But before I do that, um, I want to spend a little bit of time putting some context around this. And one of the most important uh, things about computers uh, during the last few decades is that computers are just starting. Um, the, th the very first computer uh, was uh, within the last, you know, middle of the last century. So this is a very uh, young science. Computer science is a very young science. Just to give you uh, um, some other examples, physics. Uh, 1687 was Newton's Principia Mathematica, sort of the founding um, principles that, that became physics. Again, chemistry back in 1789. Biology, you can sort of date to 1735. Uh, by contrast, computer science um, is an extremely young science. Um, the, uh, the book that I sort of grew up on was Knuth and the Art of Computer Programming. But this idea that you know, we're in such early days that not only do you not know what the potentials are, you don't know what the limitations are. And this really pervaded a lot of the uh, um, hacker culture and the early people like McCarthy and others who got involved in computers. Um, this idea that, hey, we're just, we're, we are in the midst of invented, inventing something here. Um, and of course, I mentioned the, the very first computer, the ENIAC, first electronic computer back in 1945 by uh, Eckert and Mouchley. Um, this was not programmed the way we think of today. It was programmed by plug cables, um, patch cords, 
And in fact, the, um, there was sort of a division of later. The women were the ones who did the patch, patch cords for it. Uh, the, men, the men wrote the programs. This is why I think ultimately a woman invented uh, Fortran at some point, or maybe there was some relationship there. Uh, of course, I, didn't, uh, I wasn't around back then, but the first computer I got exposed to is, is somewhat notable. It's the IBM 1800. The IBM 1800 is a computer, uh, I think it was introduced in 1963. Um, it's related to the IBM uh, 1130. It's a 16-bit computer that has 64K bytes of memory maximum. This model was used for factory control. It was the first real-time computer, quote, real-time computer that IBM made. It had been shipboard um, uh, at uh, Scripps Institute of Oceanography on a ship. And um, they, they uh, decommissioned it and sent it to UC San Diego to live in the chemistry department. And uh, what happened is a very small group of students um, were given essentially full reign of this computer to use as their, quote, personal computer. Um, we had the ability to write programs, put the programs on. There was a small uh, storage scope that was used as display. Um, and it was a, a seminal experience for both myself and Bill Atkinson, who later went to Apple, because here was a room-sized computer that was completely at your beck and call. Um, you were the only person using that computer. And you can imagine that this was an unusual circumstance in 1970, 71. Um, not too many people had personal computers. The folks at Stanford and Sale you know, ultimately had that same experience. And a few people like Larry Tesler had it, access to terminals. Um, this was a mind-bending experience to have this computer at your beck and call. And certainly for a 17 or 18-year-old, um, it, it tended to um, set, set a lot of thinking in directions of, boy, what, what can you do if you have complete ownership of this computer? That was in complete um, distinction to the campus at large that did have a mainframe. They had a CDC mainframe and then a Burroughs mainframe. And that was a computer where you went up to a window and you handed off your card deck. And then some number of hours later, they handed you a pile of uh, line printer printout. And that was the computing experience. Uh, the immediate turnaround from being able to um, type in your program, have it run, watch the results on the vector display um, uh, is, is what I think set us and other people who were being exposed at this time to this kind of environment who later went into the personal computer industry and said, you can do that with personal computers. Um, very quickly, the mainframes were replaced in the 70s by mini computers. And uh, the same thing was true at UCSD, where I was working with uh, Bill Atkinson. We had a mini computer, a PDP-11 uh, mini computer from DEC. One of the notable things about it is that um, it had a what's called an orthogonal instruction set. That means that, as opposed to earlier computers that were quite complex in their instructions, the instruction set had a small number of registers, eight registers. They were all treated the same way. You could, in fact, memorize uh, the entire instruction set, and many people did, because um, there was so much regularity to it. Um, again, you, we had this computer pretty much uh, for our own use as undergraduates. There was a fellow there by the name of Kent Wilson who ran the chemistry department who believed that undergraduates could do as interesting research as graduate students if you just sort of turn them loose, um, especially on computers. Um, one of the aspects of this computer is that was, it was hooked up to an Evans and Sutherland picture system, which was a 3D vector graphics display. In fact, serial number one of the Evans and Sutherland picture system, um, uh, which came out of Utah, was installed at uh, UC San Diego and uh, became sort of both a research instrument and, and a toy for some of us undergraduates. And you could write a really mean uh, game of space war on this thing. Uh, one of the notable aspects was that there was a, a device called a lorgnette wheel, which uh, it was a lorgnette, which you would help hold up to your eyes. There's a spinning wheel with six discs, and the six discs would alternately display, uh, expose um, the left eye and the right eye in red, green, and blue, since it was, it was a black and white display. And uh, uh, if, if you... Um, we're in a darkened enough room you could get the illusion of a color 3D display, although it did give you a headache after a while. <laughs> the, um, 
uh, sort of uh, chip revolution was was uh, uh, churning ahead, and of, of course in the uh, mid mid 70s we had the microcomputer. Um, the Altair was mentioned. This is an MSI uh, 8080, which was an 8080 chip, uh, very reminiscent uh, on its front panel display of that DEC computer. It was not a um, graphical computer by any means, and in fact, one of the things you had to do after you got your MSI 8080 was to um, beg, buy, or steal a, uh, a, a cheap teletype, mechanical teletype, to hook up to it. Or if you were really rich, you would get a CRT display with a keyboard. Um, these were not uh, uh, something that were, it was not a mass market at that time. It was uh, the, quote, hobbyist market. And uh, to bring us a little bit more up to date, this is a picture of the Apple II. The Apple II is notable because it was an all-in-one design um, for the keyboard and the power supply and the computer. Um, it was, it came out of the box programmable uh, in BASIC. Um, it had the very beginnings of package software on it. Um, VisiCalc could come out, I think, in 1979 with a uh, package spreadsheet, and, and that was sort of a revelation that, boy, you could have a package uh, software industry. One of the reasons I showed it with the top off here is that if you um, pay attention to uh, the memory chips and how they're laid out and the spacing on those, uh, the spacing on the memory chips is actually the same as the spacing on the other chips on the board. And I'll come back to that in a little bit when we talk about the Macintosh. Um, now, at the same time as the Apple II was coming out and becoming popular and selling in the low millions, the, uh, ultimately, the, the, uh, um, as was mentioned in the previous talk, um, there was a lot going on at SRI and at PARC and uh, a few other places. And uh, this is that same picture of the SRI prototype mouse invented by Doug uh, Engelbart in 1963 or thereabouts. Um, as you'll notice in this, in this photograph, you can see it is absolutely a one-button mouse. <laughs> um, now, what they ultimately uh, um, commercialized or, or distributed, um, and, and the one that the first mouse I used uh, was the three-button mouse that you see uh, Doug holding here. And um, Doug, I think, was once asked how many buttons should a mouse have, and his answer was as many as possible. Um, I'll come back to the mouse and how many buttons it has because it turns out that's an interesting window into some of the design decisions that ultimately went into the Macintosh computer. Uh, but to anyways, zoom out from this overview here on, on how, you know, what was the environment like in the early days of the uh, Macintosh design. Um, I want to uh, bring up a quote by Jeff Raskin. Jeff Raskin was the um, original manager of, of the Macintosh group uh, at Apple, really before it was a Macintosh. The design was uh, very different at that point. Um, but um, he, he had, I think, what is a correct insight. Um, he says, I think that years from now, when the details have been washed away by the aspirants of time, four major commercial events will stand out in the history of personal computers. And he named the microprocessor, package software, uh, graphical human interface, and, and the internet. And, um, uh, you know, we're, we're, we were in the midst of the microprocessor revolution in, in 1980 when I started at Apple. And uh, the packaged software revolution was just starting. As I mentioned, VisiCalc, I think, came out in, uh, in 1979. This idea that you could sell packaged software that was a spreadsheet. And um, in fact, when I first got to Apple, one of the things they showed me was um, the software uh, applications for the Apple II, which was a file cabinet that uh, one drawer with all of the, a bunch of diskettes, um, which were all of the applications known for the Apple II at the time. Um, a lot of them were freeware. A lot of them were just copied around at, at the computer clubs. But uh, as I mentioned, some of them were starting to be sold and uh, became what is now the package software industry uh, for personal computers. Uh, the graphical human interface really did not exist outside of Xerox PARC and, and uh, things like the Altos and Smalltalk. Very few people had seen it. Um, there, were, there was lots of graphics around, but uh, very little uh, graphic uh, human interface that you could interact as the main way of interacting with your computer. And of course, the internet uh, at that point in 1980 did not, uh, did not exist at all. 
Um, so this brings us up to uh, uh, the Macintosh. And um, as I mentioned, um, the work started on the Mac in, in 79 and 80. Um, the original Macintosh was not a 16-bit uh, uh, chip. It was, in fact, an 8-bit chip. And the design was based on the um, 6809 processor from Motorola. <coughs> it was uh, not, in fact, uh, based on a mouse initially. It was, it was graphical. Um, it, it did have a bitmap screen. Um, it, it did have an integral. It, at that point, it had an integral keyboard. The design was, was a nice one and uh, actually would have ended up being fairly low cost, but also fairly low performance, especially compared to the other project which was being done at Apple at that time, which was the Lisa project. The Lisa project was based on the 16-bit uh, 68000 processor, and it was um, meant to be an office computer. It ult ultimately shipped for a price point of around $10,000, so it clearly was not uh, in the same class as, as the Apple II and the personal computer. But one of the things that, uh, that, that happened during um, the early 80s was that, I w that um, uh, the, the graphical user interface for Lisa had evolved quite a bit. There was a low-level graphics package called QuickDraw. At that time, it was called LisaDraw that was developed by Bill Atkinson. And I happened to be living at his house at the time while I was working uh, on the Mac project. And uh, rather than having to reinvent all that code or port all that code to the 6809, I thought it would be easier just to base the Mac design on the 68000. And so the, uh, um, the other key engineer on the project at the time was the hardware designer for the Mac, Burl Smith. And uh, I went to him with this idea. And the only fly in the ointment was that since the memory chips were 64 by one, 64K by one memory chips, if we went to a 16-bit wide bus, we would have to bump the design spec from 64 k bits or k bytes to 128 k bytes. And uh, back in 1980-81, uh, that would have priced us way out of the market. So that uh, what Burl did is, over one night of wire wrapping, figured out how to make an 8-bit memory bus work with the 68,000 using multiplexers and demuxers, huh. and uh, uh, we were able to then convince management, which was basically Steve and, and the board of Apple, that we should switch to using a uh, 68000 processor. Hey, Bud. Yeah. Th this is Ed. So what was the internal timeline of the Mac and Lisa project? That is, we know that they were introduced several years apart, but inside the company, when did they start? Um, the, I, believe, I, I believe the Lisa project, which, which predates me at Apple, started around 79. Um, and uh, uh, the Mac project started in 1980. So, so they, were, they were pretty contemporary. The Lisa shipped about a year earlier than the Mac. I think the Lisa shipped in, in 83 or so. Um, but they were completely two different groups of people. The Macintosh project was actually a very small project initially, uh, less than a dozen people, and um, um, was, was run quite separate from the Lisa group. Uh, the Lisa group became uh, fairly large. I, it, uh, between 100 and 200 people um, uh, working on the Lisa project, uh, many of them coming from, from Xerox PARC. Uh, we had a, one or two people on the Mac team who had come from Xerox PARC. Um, the Mac team ultimately became um, uh, even more isolated when it became very secretive and we kind of moved it off campus to a place called Texaco Towers because it was behind a Texaco gas station. <laughs> and um, uh, this, this sort of isolated it uh, politically a bit uh, from the Lisa group. The other thing is that our philosophy was, I think, more of a hacker philosophy. Um, we uh, uh, were, were willing to get down and write assembly code uh, for a lot of things just to fit them into the cheaper, pro cheaper uh, memory size footprint, uh, whereas the Lisa team was writing uh, in Pascal. It was um, fairly, in our minds, verbose code. The actual source code itself was written in something called uh, Hungarian, um, which is named after Charles, uh, probably named by Charles Simone or someone around him. Simone uh, came from Xerox, went to Microsoft ultimately, 
and uh, invented this idea that every variable name should have embedded in it all the names of the types it, it is. So if you had um, a, a, hand, a pointer to a handle to an integer, uh, the, the variable name would start with um, uh, you know, point hand int. And then you'd have about three characters left over for the actual variable name. And when you <laughs> tried to read through this code, you might as well be reading Hungarian. So I think that's where the name Hungarian came from. <laughs> Um, but the cultures uh, of the two teams ended up be being very different. The Mac team internal to Apple was, was known as sort of a pirate group, um, off on their own, off in Texaco Towers, uh, very secretive. Um, although the, we weren't totally secretive, we did have some early visits uh, by Bill Gates and, and a few of his people. Um, we knew that it was going to be important to attract Microsoft to develop software for the Macintosh. So um, I think in, uh, in 82 and 83, we had some visits by Bill, and, and we went up to Redmond to visit again to try and convince, that, convince Microsoft to uh, go ahead and make the investment to develop software for the Macintosh, which they ultimately did. Um, I'm going to point out one of the things that happened in the Mac group was an incredible attention to detail. And a lot of this came from Steve, but a lot of them was also just sort of a craftsman-like approach to things that, that permeated the group. And uh, both the hardware and the software, but the, the hardware is easier to point out in some cases. So this was a 1981 breadboard uh, for, for the Macintosh. You can see at that point there, that the uh, 68000 had replaced the 6809. Um, the memory had, had actually grown to two, two rows of... Um, uh, of memory, so a 16-bit wide memory, 16 by uh, 64K. And uh, an interesting thing is that you can see the memory chips are actually spaced much closer together than, than the other chips. Um, so they're not laid out on a perfect grid. And if we jump ahead a year, um, uh, partly due the, to the influence of Steve Jobs, the uh, memory chips are now laid out in uh, exactly the same grid spacing as the rest of the chips. So this is something no one is ever going to see, uh, but we're going to see it. And uh, um, this attention to detail uh, really, really permeated the group and permeated both the software and the hardware design. Some Thomas, of the design, yeah? No one is ever going to see it on a Macintosh, but the Apple II had Velcro on its cover, inviting uh, everyone to see it. That's very true. Yep. In, in fact, at one point, Apple did make a, uh, a clear version of the Mac that you could sort of see through. Um, so some of the interesting design issues that, that were faced. Um, the operating system and the toolbox fit into uh, ROM. There was 128K bytes of, of ROM space that was used. Um, I think it was initially 64, and it grew to one, 128. And um, this is because ROM memory is a lot cheaper than, than RAM, or was a lot cheaper at that point. And so you could save, save money by sort of burning your, your um, uh, uh, basic operating system and the toolbox, which, which implemented the graphical user interface, into ROM. Uh, there is also an ulterior motive to this. One of the difficult things is to get software developers, especially at that time when we were coming out, to actually write their application using the graphical user interface their sort of knee-jerk reaction was to write it using a command line interface because that's what they were used to doing on, um, on MS-DOS or on the Apple II. And uh, by putting this code in ROM, we, we could make the argument to them that, well, if they, if they just would call our code, that would save them extra space in their own application code uh, mem memory running out of RAM. And so simply by the argument of you want to have your program run in as small a space as possible, you ought to be using the toolbox that we give you in the ROM, independent of whether a graphical user interface is better, quote, better or not. Um, there was a lot of uh, software, what I call software assist for the hardware. The software operating system got intimately involved in timing for the reading and writing the disk drive. Individual bits were being read in software. And this was all to save one or two chips on the board, which would translate into in ultimately into cost savings for the final computer. It was an interesting design decision that uh, we didn't bring out all of the address bits. In fact, the, the uh, 68000 did not bring out all the address bits 
for uh, 32 bit address space, they only, which would be 4 gigabytes. They only brought out 24 address bits, which meant that your memory maximum would be 16 megabytes. Now, this seemed infinitely large to us at the time. And so, one of the things that happened was, was we started using the upper byte of the address uh, of this 32 uh, bit address. Uh, for extra flag bits and, and uh, just extra memory that w obviously was never going to be used. It was just lying around and memory was such a scarce quantity that uh, this seemed like a good idea at the time. Uh, this actually caused no end of trouble ultimately because uh, as, as we all know, 16 megabytes was, was uh, ultimately um, not very much memory on a computer and so we sort of had to reclaim, or Apple had to reclaim those, that high order byte in order to make things run, run properly in larger memory. Hey, Bud. Yeah. So what seems funny about that is that IBM users have already been through that, right? The early 360s only used 24 bits of addressing, and then they moved to 32, and everybody used to use that high order byte for stuff in the 60s and 70s, and they, got, they, they had already fought and lost that battle in some sense. You, um, you know. Uh, yes, it's, and it's maybe worth worth pointing out that um, so I'm I'm somewhat responsible for this along with Andy Hertzfeld, and my own personal experience uh, I had, I'd never programmed an OS 360 or on an IBM 360. I had programmed on the 1800, which was a 16-bit um, computer with 64 k bytes max, and I'd programmed on the PDP 11, which was also um, you know, essentially uh, a 16-bit computer, uh, it, you could segment things and get a few more bits of memory, but that was about it. So my own personal experi experience, I think, you know, fed into this decision, which was, you know, ultimately a wrong decision. Um, we, we used a lot of assembler versus, you know, Pascal, which was the primary language on Lisa, to get things fast, but more importantly, to get things small, because we did not have a lot of memory. Everything had to fit, ultimately, in 128K bytes of RAM. Uh, a single floppy disk drive, 400K bytes. The Mac had the first um, slot load uh, disk drive that uh, Apple worked together with Sony to develop the hard shell. Prior to that, the uh, disks using the personal computer industry were the three and a half inch. They were actually floppy. They, they had a soft shell case. The Mac was the first computer to have that hard shell case drive. And then finally, uh, the, uh, no user accessible bus. There was no way to open up a Mac and, and attach something to it. Um, one of the things that, that I and others pushed hard for is to provide a knockout panel in the Mac and call it a diagnostic bus because we knew what, that at least the hobbyist community would want to um, uh, knock that out and get to it. But the argument, the counter argument was that the FCC approval would be very difficult for that and uh, actually have, having someone hook up to the bus um, would potentially lead to reliability problems. So ultimately we went with the all-in-one, not uh, no user accessible bus design. Um, as I mentioned, we used uh, uh, QuickDraw, which was the same graphic subsystem used on the Lisa. This is an early uh, dot matrix printout of a screen uh, called Max, De Max Sketch Demo. It was written by Bill Atkinson to exercise the graphics. And um, you see the patterns. We, it was a black and white computer, so um, about the, the best you could do to differentiate things on it was to use these different patterns. And these. Uh, Pattern sort of became a staple of the Macintosh, used a lot of places um, in software that were ended up being pretty ugly uh, um, and uh, sort of had to be expunged after color came along. Um, it's interesting that there was a huge amount of iteration on this design, trying it out on ourselves and a very few others, but you know, mostly trying it out on ourselves. And um, uh, one of the key requirements for working in the Mac group was to be able to rapidly write new versions of software to try out new ideas. There were no <coughs> prototyping tools like we have today. If you wanted to try out something, you basically had to write the whole program or most of it and try it out. And a lot of that was going to be assembly uh, coding. In Mac Paint, uh, which was the program where a lot of these ideas got tried out, we had a guy in Bill Atkinson who could um, literally write thousands of lines of code overnight uh, to try out ideas. and. Um, there were, there were dozens of iterations on Mac Paint. Here's a very early version of Mac Paint uh, that someone was, was, I think Steve Capps, who was one of the early Mac people, uh, actually did this uh, drawing in it. Um, interestingly, there's uh, 
there's a command called AIDS. This was in probably 1982 or 83, and um, AIDS was just being really discovered at that point by the medical community. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, when I was a medical student, I had some of the very first patients with AIDS, and uh, we actually had no idea what it was at that time. Uh, in any case, in the ultimate Mac Paint, that that menu command got renamed to Goodies. Um, if you've ever used Mac Paint, it's uh, uh, just a, a miscellaneous menu uh, menu <laughs> item. One thing I want to mention is that there was a lot of um, late night discussions and sort of um, uh, what I would call deep thinking about about the computer human interface or computer user interface on on the Macintosh. And um, you know, a lot of this was in the air. Certainly, the people at Park were were grappling with these issues. But um, one of the uh, interesting things this is a um, uh, a picture of um, of uh, Jean Piaget, and he's a psych psychologist who had this theory of uh, development of the mind, stages of development of the mind. And one of the early stages, I think, around year one. That, uh, that babies develop is something called object persistence. That means if you have an object and you hide it, um, the person knows that it's still there and expects if you move the obstruction that it will still be there and acts surprised if it's not there. And as I mentioned, children develop this around age one. There's a, a few animals who have uh, uh, the ability to, to object, um, know that objects persist. And uh, it was actually a strong driver on the Macintosh, presenting this illusion that the things on the screen are objects which have a lot of the properties that in your most basic neural wiring you expect them to have. Um, that, that things that when you drag them around stay where you, wh where you place them. Um, again, the thought of leveraging off the fact that the human mind is pretty hardwired to know how to um, retrieve spatial memories of things probably comes about because that was one of the ways you survived by being able to find uh, your food sources again. Um, if you found a tree with berries, you really wanted to be able to f go back to that same tree uh, to get those berries. One of the very early uh, iterations of the Finder, what ultimately became the Mac Finder, which was the interface to the file system, uh, sort of took this to, to an extreme. Uh, which would not have been that useful, but uh, we then backed off it. But this is the um, uh, a finder where you actually disp display a uh, floppy disk. This is before we had the hard shell disk from Sony. And you display uh, a floppy disk, and then you actually have a little uh, icon or, or uh, text image of the name of the file. And you can drag these things around, and, it's so, and, and the idea is that you really get the concept, uh, if, you, if you're not a computer user at all, that these things exist, uh, these files exist, they are on the disk. Uh, if you put them on the disk, they stay where you put them. One of the things about this diagram worth noting is the do it command. Um, the do it command, I believe, came from the Lisa group uh, originally. They used it as the, uh, as the command to do it, which, which makes sense, and, and there's uh, often uh, a dialogue with the do it command and a cancel command. One of the big revelations was that um, this did not go over well with users. And uh, this was actually something, a lot of things were found by testing it out on ourselves, but this was one thing that was found by user testing. When you put something that says do it in front of someone, they actually don't really know what it means. And there was one guy in particular where we videotaped it and when you played back the videotape, every single time he would not hit the do it button. He would hit the, I think, the cancel button in that case. And um, this was very odd until we finally, we turned the audio way up on the videotape and we could hear, hear him uh, muttering under his breath. And he was saying, dolt, dolt, <laughs> dolt, <laughs> and he'd press cancel. <laughs> so user testing, uh, which really, that, the idea of heavy user testing came out of the um, human factors movements in the 60s. Uh, my dad was actually a human factors designer in the, in the NASA uh, Apollo program. Um, but a lot of the guys at Park, uh, Larry Tesler and others, lived and died by user testing. And that, that propagated itself into uh, the Lisa group and, and somewhat into the Mac group. 
Um, I already mentioned design by iteration, incredibly important, especially when the user interface is involved. That's because the human part of that loop is totally unpredictable, as the example of Dolt uh, recently, uh, I, I recently gave you. Um, so that the, the user is part of that feedback uh, loop. The best case is when the user is the developer because that feedback loop is very short, <laughs> but it's actually the rare person who can be a good proxy for your average user. I actually think it was a skill that some people um, had, some people didn't have. A lot of the people on the Mac group actually had that. And then finally, the importance of taste uh, and good design. And as I'll come back to, a, lo a lot of that uh, was uh, comes from uh, Steve Jobs. Question from San Diego. Um, <coughs> just a few words about the user interface. Of course, it was graphical. It was the first uh, commercialized graphical user interface. One way of thinking about that is um, all systems up to that point have big command line interfaces, all commercial systems. And in a command line interface, you're faced with a blank screen and you have to type. And that's sort of like an essay test. Whereas the graphical user interface was a lot more like a multiple choice test. You had all the answers there and all you had to do was choose one. And that's the fundamental underlying principle of why graphical user interfaces are easier to use or, or one of the key things. Um, so uh, we also invented the idea of the menu bar at the top, the uh, pull down menu. Um, these came out of Lisa and the Mac. Uh, no modes, Larry Tesler had a t-shirt that said, don't mode me in. And the idea here was that there should be no modes uh, that all of the um, uh, commands you could do at any one time should be visible on the screen. You shouldn't have to get into a different mode to do a different command. One button mouse uh, requires a bit of mention. The um, idea there is really that it's optimized for uh, learning how to use the computer by watching somebody else use it. If you think about um, um, someone using a computer with a two button mouse, they may in fact be more efficient, but the guy who's watching him do something and expects to learn how to do it has no idea whether they're pushing left uh, mouse button or right mouse button. So it's really a question of what are you optimizing for? Since nobody in the world to a first approximation knew anything about graphical user interfaces, there was a lot of optimizing towards easy to learn um, versus efficient to use once you've already learned it. A more, I think an even more important principle in the Mac uh, user interface design was the idea of learning by exploring. That you should be able to um, sit there and just poke around at the system and it should be, uh, there should be things that sort of grab your attention and make you poke on them. And you should never feel like you shouldn't poke on something. Um, this led to the concept of undo, uh, for example. The undo was implemented by the Lisa group to be um, the, the fool, you know, you can do undo everything you can do. The Mac group backed off and said, uh, we'll do one level undo. If you do something and you want to back out one level, you can. You can't keep undoing after that. Again, with the memory constraints, that was about all we could do. Uh, interestingly, the star, which shipped uh, uh, out of Xerox, um, didn't implement undo at all. They had an undo key, but you couldn't do an undo. This is a great example of, um, you know, when, when you look at, at the, the star and you, you see that undo button, you go, well, of course, undo is a great idea. And, you, and we didn't understand that the Xerox people found it too hard to do undo. So we went ahead and did it anyway. Uh, we didn't understand that it was too hard to do. Another example of this is that uh, when uh, Bill Atkinson um, initially saw the small talk overlapping windows, he thought that you could, as a programmer, draw into any window even draw into windows that were behind other windows. Well, it turns out on the Alto and on, on, the, uh, on, the, um, on Smalltalk, you can't do that. Uh, you can only draw into the frontmost window because that's the easy programming problem. But Bill didn't know that. He thought, you know, how are you going to make it draw into the back window because that's probably what the guys at Xerox are doing. And he actually invented something called regions, which was a way to graphically draw in windows that were behind other windows, because he didn't know any better. He didn't know that, that really smart people had looked at that and decided that was too hard to do. We'll just paint into the front window. A lot of examples of, of things like that. Um, so ultimately, the Mac shipped in 1984. Uh, this, is, this is what the Mac user interface looked like at that point. Uh, one of the key things that happened subsequent to that is that 
uh, the, there was a, a three-way deadly combination or killer combination, which was the Macintosh with the graphical user interface and WYSIWYG word processing for the masses, uh, combined with um, Adobe inventing a PostScript printer in conjunction with Apple that was cheap enough for um, at least offices and, and uh, businesses to buy, combined with Aldis PageMaker, which was an application for doing this paste up um, uh, on the computer, so you could do uh, desktop user publishing, desktop uh, publishing. Desktop publishing drove uh, uh, not only Mac sales, but drove a lot of the industry for for a long time, and um, was was really only made possible by the fact that you had this combination of three things: graphical user interface, laser cheap laser printers, um, and uh, applications like Alice PageMaker. Now, in 1985, I'm going to do a time check here. When? 9.30 is the official end. official end? 9.30. 9.30. Okay, great. Um, so to shift gears a little bit, in 1985, um, a, a, a year or so after the Macintosh shipped, Steve Jobs left Apple. And um, ultimately, uh, five of us, uh, including myself, left Apple with him to form a company called Next. Next computer, and the um, original idea behind Next, Steve had, had spent the summer um, talking to uh, people like Paul Berg at Stanford and, and gotten really interested in higher education. So the initial idea for Next was to build a computer for higher education. In fact, a group of people in higher education had, had written sort of a blueprint for what would the the dream computer be in higher education. They call it the 3M machine, which meant that it would have um, uh, a million bytes of memory run at uh, one MIP, uh, one million instructions per second, and have a million pixels on the screen, a megapixel display. And in their minds, this was the, the perfect computer. And so uh, computers at that time were, were really not very near that. Um, a, a, a typical, well, the initial Mac that shipped was 128K of, of RAM and a 400K floppy disk. Ultimately, you might be able to um, uh, get, get a larger screen on it, but I think the screens didn't get over uh, uh, around 600 by 480 for, for quite a while. So this was, this was a bit of a reach, um, but uh, uh, we were very interested we, in reaching and, and the higher education goals um, were very attractive, and Steve was able to, you know, bring this group of people from Apple over to Next. And um, it was a it was a little bit of a rocky start. Start initially, Apple sued um, the company for you know sort of uh, taking these people away from Apple. But very quickly, Apple found it was not a good idea to sue your founder. It led to uh, a lot of uh, headlines you don't want to see in the press, and and that eventually went away, and we got started in earnest. Um, an interesting thing that happened, one of the first um, uh, sort of field trips we made, Steve asked us to, to show up the next day and get on a plane to uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We had no idea what, what this was for. But um, he said he wanted to set, set the company on, on the right path initially. And um, so we showed up, we, we got in Pittsburgh, and we drove about two hours out of town to a place called Falling Water. So we had all six of us, the whole company, basically, um, at Falling Water. And Falling Water is, is sort of an, it, it's an architectural masterpiece by Frank Lloyd Wright. And um, uh, with, with the epitome of beauty and craftsmanship. And we spent the better part of a day um, uh, touring through the house and looking at all the details in, in Falling Water. And then we flew back to California. Uh, that is probably unusual for a company uh, for, to do at its founding, but it really um, gives you an insight into some of the things that, that drove Steve Jobs uh, that had to do with aesthetics, uh, with design, with craftsmanship. Um, all those things w were present in the Mac, Mac group and, and really got uh, trans transferred uh, into the next culture. Um, you see here the design of, of the Next as it ultimately came out. The hardware design was a cube, 12 inches by 12 inches by 12 inches. It, uh, it actually met uh, or exceeded the 3M specs, um, with the exception of the screen, which was not quite a megapixel, but it, but it was close. Um, 
The, uh, uh, this is a very early shot of the very first Next Step user interface. It's uh, a few of the notable things. It had multimedia email. Uh, you can't really see it very well, but this is uh, a little picture of lips in there. It actually, you could re make a recording, and there was this um, uh, feature called lip service. So uh, you could speak into your mail message, and that message would get recorded and be a pair of lips, and whoever received that would see lips, and when they clipped it, it would play back your, uh, play back your message. The screen itself was, um, interestingly, uh, it was grayscale. And there were only uh, two bits. So you could have four different values. You could have uh, black, light gray, dark gray, and white. Um, and those were re represented by, by a two-bit value on the screen. And this was a compromise. It was a compromise because um, I and, and, and some others insisted that we have more than, than one bit. So there's a, uh, um, a saying in computer science that uh, there's only three numbers, zero, one, and many. And uh, because if you go beyond zero and one and, and go to two, three, four, five, six, et cetera, uh, there's a whole set of problems you have to solve. And the same is true with graphics. Once you commit to having more than one bit per pixel, um, there's a lot of things that you have to, a lot of problems you have to solve that will stand you in good stead when someday you can do eight bits or someday you can do 32 bits with millions of colors. And um, this was exactly the reason for doing two bits. It was a little bit more expensive, but it really drove the software design in, in a number of ways that made it very easy to quickly move on to color uh, once that became cheap enough to do. Um, next step was, was a combination of CMU Mach, which was a microkernel, uh, plus uh, Berkeley uh, standard distribution Unix, so the Berkeley flavor of Unix, uh, which is called 4.3 at that point. Um, those were melded into, into the plumbing, the operating system for Next Step. Uh, interesting story, we used the GNU GCC compiler. So open source was just getting started at that point. Richard Stallman um, had an Emacs um, application, uh, an editing application um, that uh, he was distributing under uh, the copy left. And the GNU uh, uh, group had a, a compiler. And the price was right for us. It was free, um, although it came under this copyleft uh, license. Uh, we, it, to us, it seems totally natural because Unix, Berkeley Unix at that time was also being distributed uh, more or less for free. And it had a long history going back to the 60s of being distributed for free. So free software didn't seem like um, that big a deal to us. Um, there was a meeting at some point um, uh, between Steve Jobs and Richard Stallman that was sort of, uh, I don't think, <laughs> a whole lot of communication took place. But we did end up using uh, the, the GNU compiler, and we had an, uh, what's called Objective-C, an Objective-C front end on that to turn, to add some object-oriented constructs, um, which were well proven in the small talk world, but um, to us, the idea of, of using that together with C seemed like a, a good combination. The display was uh, built on Display PostScript, which we developed with Adobe. And the idea was that if you're going to do WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get, then your very graphic primitives should be the same ones that, that you're using on the printer. And uh, there really wasn't enough processing power to do that in the Mac or any previous computer. But with the next computer and this 3M idea, you finally had enough processing power, if you were clever, to make display, uh, to make PostScript uh, really the graphical primitives. Then you have zero mismatch between what you see on the screen uh, and, and what, uh, what ultimately gets printed out. Um, the next step GUI was overlapping windows, um, had, had a more multimedia feel to it with things like lip service and um, sound actually became a very important part of the computer. Interface Builder was a tool that had not been seen before. It was beyond compilers. It was how do you build a graphical user interface uh, using drag and drop, using the graphical interface itself. And Interface Builder um, really uh, did an excellent job of that. Uh, ultimately, it led to a lot of derivative work that uh, is very similar to that, building GUIs with GUIs. But uh, at the time, it was sort of a revelation to people. Um, Many other things packaged onto the computer, as I mentioned, multimedia email. Interestingly, we, we included the uh, Webster's Dictionary and the complete works of William Shakespeare. 
Now, that would not have made any sense at all if the internet and the web existed because um, you can find these things on, on the internet today. But uh, at the time, uh, it being an educational computer, and we had some space on the disk. We actually had a pretty large disk, as I'll get into. Uh, Mathematica, the first version of Mathematica uh, by Stephen Wolfram was actually written for the next computer and shipped with the next computer. There was something called, called uh, Godzilla by a fellow, uh, Richard Crandall, who um, essentially, I, I find it to be one of the first examples of grid computing. If you had a network of next computers, uh, you could actually send um, uh, jobs to them all, and when no one was doing anything, any typing or mousing on the computer, it would actually work on that background job. As soon as you touched a key or moved the mouse, um, it would stop doing that and, and pay attention to you. But it actually allowed you to um, corral a lot of computers on the network to solve problems. And I think one of the things Richard did is at some point he had um, either one of the largest primes or a similar math problem that, that the next uh, com uh, computer network at Next itself had solved. Music Kit done in conjunction with uh, um, uh, Karma at Stanford, a very extensive uh, um, ability to simulate instruments using physical simulation. And there was a DSP, which was a Motorola 56000 part, uh, which was an attached processor that was extremely good and fast at signal processing, and that was used in the sound and music subsystem. Uh, FrameMaker uh, initially came out as a word processing program. So it was a, it was a very complete system. It all shipped on an, um, a read-write optical disk, which was, I think, the first uh, read-write optical disk on a, on a workstation or computer. It was a 256 megabyte disk, which again seemed to us huge, huge enough to just throw on the complete works of Shakespeare and, and the Webster's Dictionary. Um, one of the problems was that this was the only disk, and it was extremely slow. So we had to actually do a lot of innovative things with the paging system and virtual memory. Uh, you could also only write to the disk so many times, which was a problem for virtual memory. And uh, it turns out that this did not last too long. Pretty quickly, uh, as a follow-on uh, um, product, Next came out with a, a version of the computer that had a hard disk drive in it as well. One of the interesting things about the Next computer is that it got in the hands of a lot of smart people. And you can imagine, you know, that's pretty natural. It's, it's aimed at higher education and research, and that's, that's exactly what happened. Well, one place it ended up was CERN in the hands of Tim Berners-Lee. And uh, he used it to write um, essentially what became the World Wide Web. And uh, I remember at one point he, he actually showed this um, to us and to, to some other people at, at Next, um, demoing what is essentially the World Wide Web uh, with one problem, the World Wide Web did not exist at that point. And so we looked at it and we said, well, who, who really wants to look at documents at CERN? Um, because that's all you could look at it. That was the extent of the web at that point, was the uh, research documents at CERN. Um, but uh, uh, luckily, it, it became ported to other systems and, and uh, uh, went, went the rest, as we say, is history. But um, at one of the uh, World Wide Web conferences last, uh, I think in the late 90s, they actually had the next cube where he had written the World Wide Web, in, web enshrined in a plexiglass um, uh, case showing this is, this is where the web was born. Interestingly, the browser he initially wrote was not a read-only browser, it was a read-write browser. So it was both a browser and an editor. Um, and um, it's interesting that you know the the uh, Netscape browser that that uh, um, came out of Mosaic was a read-only browser, so it kind of left behind that ability to edit the web, um, which has come back now recently with the wiki. But uh, there's you know if you think about it, one of the things that that didn't exist in the original um, browser was any sort of notion of bookmarks, because um, if, if your browser can also be an editor, you would never think of wanting to have bookmarks. You would just have a page with all of your links on it that you were interested in. Those are your bookmarks. So the whole concept of bookmarks becomes unnecessary if you have a read-write uh, browser. Um, uh, so I think, I think the next computer in this and Mathematica and many other ways ended up having a, a pretty large um, impact on the world. But beyond that, 
Um, this is towards the end of, of Next's existence because Next, uh, when Steve Jobs came back to Apple, one of the things he did was acquire the company Next along with Next Step and all of its software. And, and this is a screenshot um, of Next Step uh, uh, sort of around that time. And you can see um, someone had, had written an email message that short, sort of uh, talked about uh, Apple and Next uh, merging. One of the outcomes of that was not only you know some of the people merging into Apple, but some of the technology as well. And uh, really, the operating system that the Mac used from Mac OS 1 through Mac OS 9, version 9, was a pretty unbroken stream. Um, there was probably even some bits of code that were that were still in there at that point. The architecture was pretty much uh, the same. There was some some multitasking added and, and higher. Um, uh, you know, 32-bit pointers and things like that. But Mac OS X became really a pretty complete break from that, that lineage in that it switched over to being Unix-based. Uh, in fact, Mach and, and uh, BSD Unix-based um, like, like Next Step was. And of course, with Mac OS X, uh, which is actually denoted with a Roman numeral 10, a lot of the um, uh, uh, user interface changed as well. Just a, a couple of brief words on open source. And, um, uh, you know, open source is both a software development methodology and a religion. And the two sides don't always uh, talk to each other on the same terms. But actually, the, the um, uh, software development methodology was one of the um, first things that, that struck me when open source really started taking off. Of course, I had been exposed to it back with Richard Stallman, so I got the whole religious part of it as well. And a lot of that came out of the Berkeley uh, Unix culture as well. But um, this idea that um, you could have a large number of people working on code all around the world and uh, in real time on, on internet relay chat and all working on the same source tree was just a revelation. Uh, at the time, I had, I had been away at Sun Microsystems for about seven years, and one of the holy grails for the software, uh, the, the formal software development community was follow the sun, what was called follow the sun development, where you could have tools and networks so that you could have people in India and Australia and the US and Europe all working on software 24 by 7 as the sun went around. Um, no one was ever able to make this work uh, very well uh, some people have claimed to, but, but what actually does work is open source. And this is what you see as just normal course of development using open source method methodology. People from multiple continents all working on the same source tree, all communicating on the internet. And somehow it just works. And I think it actually manages to at least a little bit uh, uh, break uh, Brooks' law. In the Mythical Man Month, uh, Fred Brooks, who developed IBM OS 360, uh, said that complexity and communication costs for project rise with the square of the number of developers, while the work done only rises linearly. And um, this quickly, as you get beyond seven programmers, means that your complexity and communication kills a project. And um, you know, I can only imagine what's what's you know happening. Uh, uh, in Microsoft and other places with huge projects. Uh, Brooks Law will just kill you. And uh, on the other hand, with open source, it's interesting. They seem to somehow avoid, and I'm not sure exactly how, but, but this phenomenon to me seems real, that they somehow avoid Bro Brooks Law for a while. And um, I, it's, it's, it's probably worth someone studying it and finding out why that is. Um, just uh, quickly, the history of Mac OS X and, and some of the uh, contributions and influences that went into it. We start back with Bell Labs Unix in the 60s. Um, and uh, of course, that led to a whole variety of flavors of Unix. The one that ended up being uh, used in Next Step was uh, 4.2 BSD out of Berkeley, along with CMU's microkernel. Um, and uh, those came together in, in Next Step. Uh, that was ultimately ported to other platforms like Sun, uh, Spark, and Intel in the form of, of OpenStep. And um, uh, ultimately, uh, as I said, Next was acquired, and uh, that technology got folded into Mac OS X. And of course, a lot of the influence, especially with the user interface, came down 
uh, from Mac OS 1 through 9 as well. And then finally, the underpinnings, um, uh, rather than the Berkeley standard distribution, uh, NEC, uh, Apple uses something called FreeBSD as the basis for its uh, underlying Unix. And that, that actually is a derivative of, of uh, Berkeley Unix. So just an interesting family tree there of, of sort of all the pieces that came together in Mac OS X. Um, and uh, here's a you know, recent screenshot. I think this is the Mac OS 10.4, which is our, our most uh, recent shipping version. And uh, some of the, the uh, next influences, the, the next machine came up with a dock. This, the whole sort of multimedia feel, um, I, I feel that at least the next culture really encouraged that. Of course, Apple had, had quick time and a lot of that culture as well, but it's, it's really come to fruition uh, with the Mac OS X. Here's an interesting um, slide. So it's hard to see the top there. Um, I don't know why it didn't come out well, but it's, it's comparing the 1984 um, uh, Macintosh specs with the typical specs of a Mac computer in, in 2006. And here you can see CPU speed speeded up uh, quite a bit and uh, you know, roughly a factor of 300 there. That lets us do a lot of things like um, uh, display PostScript that we, um, or you know, PostScript graphical primitives, and now even more complex graphical primitives that we couldn't do before. Uh, RAM, of course, has gone way beyond the uh, 128K factor of 8,000. But the real story to me is if you look at this drive, which is, uh, at least if you start at the 400 kilobyte, it's a factor of uh, 200,000. But even if you start at something like 5 megabyte, which was the size of the uh, first hard disk for personal computers on the market, uh, you get a huge factor in storage. And I think that um, that's actually one of the big challenges of, of fully utilizing computers today. One of the things that uh, we noticed um, a few releases ago was that it, it was easier to find stuff on the web than it was to find stuff on your own, own hard disk. And there's something wrong with that. Um, and so uh, one of the things we did is, in, is introduce a technology called Spotlight, which is ba basically searching for your own hard disk, full text search, inverted index search for your own hard disk that's kept continually up to date as you add and, and remove uh, and edit files on your disk. But um, I think utilizing that storage properly and more importantly, how do you back it up is, is one of the big challenges. Um, still, no one backs up their hard disk. Hey, the other challenge, yeah. Sorry, can I go back and ask another open source question? Sure. So I'm, I'm interested in uh, roughly what the size of your OS group is. My impression is it's pretty small compared to what we in Seattle are used to. And I wonder how open source relates to that. And to what extent is OS 10 refreshed from uh, open source? And to what extent did you snapshot open source and you're holding the bag for carrying it forward? Um, sure. Well, so um, I mean, open, open source is code is um, e an evolving code body. And um, in my opinion, it's actually not useful. It's not very useful unless you, you yourself or you have um, programmers who are involved in the community that's developing that project. Um, I, I think there's really, uh, it, it's almost impossible in my mind to actually snapshot something and, and use it because um, uh, the, the knowledge that's embodied in source code is not by any way, shape, or form or, uh, formalized. It's why Knuth call it the art of computer programming. Um, you really can't take a uh, steaming pile of code from someone else and do anything useful for it, with it uh, is a shorthand way of putting that. Um, so, so what that means is that for the open source projects that are in Mac OS X, um, we, as much as possible, have our own programmers involved in the community developing that code. So, um, you know, FreeBSD itself, we, we participate and interact um, heavily with those guys. Uh, thing, things like Kerberos that would be a huge team if we had to write that from scratch. But the folks at, uh, 
MIT are, and, and the, the whole community around Kerberos is doing that, but we have people on our team who are also part of that community. And I think maintaining that live connection is absolutely key to being able to use open source at all in, in any sort of project. Um, roughly, uh, probably half the lines of code that we ship are open source, and about half the lines are proprietary source. The proprietary source tends to be uh, graphical user interface related code, um, as well as application code, things like iTunes. And um, uh, I personally believe that it's very difficult in the open source community uh, to develop um, anything that, that has that user um, really closely inserted in the feedback loop. That would include uh, graphical user interfaces and that would include uh, applications, consumer applications like iTunes or iPhoto. And I think those things are actually best done by very small groups, uh, tight-knit groups of people who can develop a design language and a design uh, schema uh, and communicate that to each other really every day um, during development. Having a large distributed group of people develop a GUI, I think, leads to too much of a phenomenon of every good idea gets thrown in and uh, you don't end up with, um, uh, I don't know, you don't end up with falling water, you end up with Mexico City or something like that. Huh. Thanks. Um, as I mentioned, you know, it's a, it's a, these are large projects. Um, they only work if you, if you break them up into components, but any, uh, all of these systems today, uh, Mac, OS X, Vista, Linux, are on the order of 10 to the eighth lines of code, somewhere between um, uh, 10, 10 million lines and, and 100 million lines, maybe half, maybe uh, 50 million lines of code in that range. That's a lot of code to sling around. We never uh, could even imagine that in the early Mac days. Uh, we didn't have the tools to do that. Um, to some extent, we, hit, we sort of have the tools um, to sling around this much code, but I'm not sure that we have the uh, cognitive sense to, to really understand what's going on. Um, I think it remains a challenge and will continue to remain a challenge for things like program correctness, um, um, you know, the number of bugs per line, the uh, security issues that come up. Um, there's, there's no magic bullet around this. Um, this is a, uh, you can't read this, it's not meant to be read. What you're meant to see on this is that this is when the initial Mac shipped and of course Apple continued to, to develop um, uh, derivatives of this product line. And you can see that at a certain point there was an awful lot of different, uh, there were an awful lot of different uh, versions of the Macintosh. Uh, this is just the hardware products um, that are shipping. And uh, interestingly from this diagram you can see when Steve Jobs came back to Apple and um, one of the key things he did, Apple was, you know, in, in tough straits uh, business-wise at that, financially at that point, one of the key things he did was to simplify the product lines and to simply say we're going to stop doing a bunch of stuff. Um, for example, that's when the Newton uh, went away. Um, I, I think that was a, a, a key event in Apple's history and this idea of keeping things simple though uh, really goes back to the company's roots and the company's culture. And I think, uh, you know, I'll have a few examples of, of that later on. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because of time, but uh, it is notable that this has become a mobile world and uh, this is an unstoppable. This is actually an old graph. This is from 04. But, uh, and, and this is students entering into uh, colleges and universities and what they have with them, laptops versus desktops. And uh, this trend is actually even more pronounced today. Um, and this is where a lot of our, our current um, uh, efforts are, are aimed at, at, you know, in this mobile world. And, and you can look at the iPod as another example of that. Um, I'm going to skip that for time. And I, I will do these three slides. Three slides. Uh, the culture at, at Apple, uh, a lot of it does um, emanate uh, from Steve, but a lot of it at this point is institutionalized very heavily into the company. And um, he was asked uh, by Business Week in 2004, how do you systematize innovation? And I think his answer is, is uh, a good reflection of what actually goes on at Apple. He says, the system is that there is no system. That doesn't mean we don't have a process. Apple is very a very disciplined company. We have great processes, 
but that's not what it's about. Process makes you more efficient, but it doesn't help you. But innovation comes from people meeting up in the hallways or calling each other at 10.30 at night with a new idea or because they realize something that shoots holes in how we've been thinking about a problem. It's ad hoc meetings of six people called by someone who thinks he has figured out the coolest new thing ever and who wants to know what other people think of his idea. And, and, and that is what drove the early Mac group and I think that is uh, what dri continues to drive Apple today. In fact, drives, I think, a lot of the open source culture and hacker culture as well. Um, and this is a key one. Innovation comes from saying no to 1,000 things and to make sure we don't get on the wrong track or try to do too much. And uh, any successful open source project has someone who's really good at saying no, for example. And uh, uh, that slide that showed the product lineup and, and what happened when Steve came back is a good example of, of saying no and uh, the concept that sort of less is more. And a sort of graphical user or graphical representation of this, this is Apple's design uh, for remote control versus the, um, uh, 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 a different design for remote control uh, from Microsoft. <laughs> and, and, you know, our, our idea was that um, go back to first principles and, and you know, what, what you want to, if what you want to do is watch a show, why are you typing in numbers to your TV? Um, and uh, why not leverage what goes on on the screen to make that uh, uh, process a lot simpler? And, um, you know, of course, features sometimes get left out when you do this, but that, that concept of knowing when to say no is an important one. Um, uh, again, making applications simpler. These are little dashboard widgets that are going back to breaking up applications into smaller pieces, making them simpler. These are actually based on web 2.0 type technology, uh, JavaScript and uh, HTML. Um, another uh, bringing you up to current thing, directions we're thinking in, again, making things simpler. This is uh, something called front row. It's the idea that if you're using your computer to uh, consume media to you know, sit in your living room and watch your TV, you really have to even the desktop metaphor is, is way too complex. And we're not you know, alone in thinking of this, but Apple's approach to this is really, um, I think, uh, uh, baked into the company culture and, and stands us in good stead when we do things like design iPod user interfaces or, or front row. Um, and, and finally, the, the other idea or thread that remains at Apple is this idea of integrating things together. Um, you know, I could talk about I, iTunes and iPod being integrated together, but um, we're still continuing the trend here. This, the flat panel screen is, is integrated with, um, uh, you know, with, with, the, uh, 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 with the actual computer so that the computer is actually in the lower part and, and back behind the screen. Another notable thing is that the camera is now integrated. You know, if you can integrate a camera into every phone, why shouldn't you have a camera integrated into every computer? Um, okay, well, I'm going to uh, stop there and see if there's any questions. UW? Questions up here? Yeah. Oh, Shut up. When you were working on uh, Next, right at the beginning, were you using Macintoshes to do that work? Um, no, we were actually using uh, Sun Microsystem workstations. Huh. I mean, I, I'm sure we did some word processing on a Mac. Yeah, another one from UW. I was wondering too on the Mac and also at Next, you mentioned PostScript is uh, something that was highly leveraged. And then I was wondering with OS uh, seven, when TrueType was uh, was TrueType was integrated with the Mac platform, and how did that I, that was uh, like compatible with but not dependent on PostScript, right? And then how did that impact the relationship with Adobe and also the users of the, the desktop publishing. Yeah, well that's interesting. That, that was during the time that I was actually at Next. Or, or I, actually I might have been at Sun Microsystems at that point, but I was not at Apple. So I can't speak to Apple internally. It was clear externally that there was a lot of, um, you know, tension between, um, which was actually always there, the tension between Adobe and, and Apple. Um, as well as, you know, intense collaboration and, and synergy. And um, 
I think in the case of um, uh, typefaces, that was uh, uh, you know a situation where Apple went uh, for a while in, in their own direction. But I, since I wasn't there, I probably can't talk directly to your to your question. Well, but was there a cost issue? I mean, I remember the PostScript interpreters used to be really expensive, and I remember that the next laser printer was remarkably inexpensive because you used the PostScript driver that was in the machine to drive the printer. The printer didn't have another. Um, yes, well, that was partly, um, I mean, the, the, the cost issue um, was absolutely both the software and hardware amortized across both the workstation and, and the printer. So the printer was a dumb printer. It was, it was like a dumb dot matrix printer. There was no uh, PostScript inside the printer. Uh, since we already had PostScript running for the display, it was uh, very easy to, to use that, reuse that same code um, to do the printing work and to just spread it out to the printer instead of the screen. So it was, it was cost savings on both the hardware and the software. Did you guys have font designers at Apple? Um, absolutely. In, in the early Mac days, there really were no... Um, well, I don't want to say there were no bitmap fonts, but there were no there were no good um, typographically designed bitmap fonts at that point. The bitmap fonts actually were an evolution from the seven segment LED displays, and when they figured out how to put more LEDs in, in dots, um, and they invented dot matrix printers, they came up with some uh, bitmap fonts. But we actually had a group um, at Apple that uh, Susan Kerr was was. Uh, one of the lead uh, designers there who came up with the typography and the bitmap fonts that, that were in Mac. And um, I think Apple's, uh, you know, continued for some time after that to do their own fonts. At this point, we, we don't do our own fonts uh, for the most part because there's such a huge uh, font industry out there um, doing fonts. And they're no longer bitmap, they're now spline fonts. I more saw. Yeah. I am. Um, one comment, fallen water leaked, horrifically. Oh, yes. But, uh, for my question, I'm wondering whether the scully time at Apple, I know you weren't there. Was that, was that a good thing for Apple to get a break in the, in the reality distortion field that Jobs had? Or would Apple be light years ahead if Jobs had never left, if you had never left? Um, well, of course, that, that question is impossible to answer. Um, you know, I, I, I was there for a very brief time when, when Scully was there. Um, Steve actually hired Scully into the company. I think the question you're asking, was it good for the company to take a break from Steve? Um, I think that it might have been good for Steve to take a break from the company. One of the first things that Scully did was raise the price of the Mac, which must have got to pay for marketing, which I, if I were on the team, I probably would have been a little insulted. Oh, well, cer certainly I think a lot of um, decisions would have been different with different management. Um, and um, I, I do think price point was a key issue in, in what happened with the Mac versus the PC. Uh, it's not clear that, though, that competing on price, directly competing on price uh, with the PC would have been a winning strategy, Other, uh, you know, e even so, because, um, of course, the PC was taking advantage of, of the horizontal disintegration of, of uh, the industry and manufacturing, and the Mac continued to be manufactured by Apple. So, um, uh, you know, was that a good decision? Uh, in, in retrospect, I think it didn't work out very well. <laughs> San Diego? Yeah, I got a question. Can you hear me over there? Yeah, go ahead. You can? Okay. Uh, you, you mentioned on the quotes Anybody about here? innovation. Um, basically, uh, yes, not. We have a question from our other speaker. Oh, wait a sec. Hey, Steve? Yeah? San Diego is asking a question, but you can't hear them. So, San Diego, why don't you ask the question and I'll repeat it, okay? <laughs> Thanks. Uh, okay. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's going to be a little about the innovation part. Basically, it's going to be the like same question they asked. <laughs> basically, seemed like you were talking about lack of structure there at Apple, and 
My question is, is Apple ISO certified or anything? Because I know they have the standards or, or anything like CMMI. It'll be a, it'll be a three word question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'll, I'll do the best I can with this. Yeah, yeah. please. <laughs> yeah. So, so it, it, the, in your the quotes about innovation from Steve, it spoke to sort of lack of structure, and the question was, is Apple ISO certified or something like that? Um, well, I think it actually uh, spoke about lack of lack of a system, not lack of structure. In fact, you talked about process being very important. Um, but um, so so ISO is is a process oriented thing and, and doesn't have to do with you know what's your system to innovate it has to do with you have process to do it efficiently uh, and and you know Apple has ISO 9000 for for manufacturing and things like that we have common criteria process for our software security so there's, there's a lot of process there but when you start to talk about What's the system? Can you systematize innovation? Um, that's, a, I think, a different question. And um, I think Steve's answer is correct, that there, there is not really a way to do that. Um, I don't know. Maybe there's a drug that can do that. <laughs> but, but we, you know, I don't think anyone um, really thinks they've, they've systematized. Um, I mean, if you did that, that would be augmentation. <laughs> How big is the company now? How many heads? Yeah, a question. Um, I think we're the better part of um, uh, 20,000. Uh, the, the company has grown in headcount tremendously uh, due to opening retail stores. So we have, I think, on the order of 150 retail stores <laughs> around the world. And all of those uh, are staffed by Apple employees. Ed, can you shuttle some more? Yeah, is there another uh, San Diego question? Go ahead. Yeah, one more San Diego question. I've, I've been uh, very impressed with Apple's commitment to computing for people with disabilities, and I'm interested in hearing more about the uh, story behind that within Apple, their commitment to people with disabilities in computing. So, uh, Bud, the question is, uh, the person who spoke has been very impressed with Apple's commitment to computing for people with disabilities and is interested in hearing more about that thread, where that commitment arose from, and what sustains it. Mm -hmm. um, well, that I think that's um, been a thread at Apple. I know that, uh, so I've been back at Apple for five years now, and uh, it was also, um, it's something that's been one of my interests, and I've been pushing in my capacity for it. Um, you know, it ultimately, it, it widens your market. Um, and it also pushes you in directions that I think all end up sparking ideas that are um, good, good for the entire population as well. So um, I also think that, that uh, uh, at this point in time, at least for uh, you know, stand, a lot of the standard things you do on computer, there, there's really no excuse not to do it. There's plenty of processing power. Um, the architectures we have uh, support, support it pretty well. So I, I think there, there could potentially be a problem in it becoming uh, too highly regulated. In other words, um, there's a temptation uh, to, by some governments, um, because not everything is accessible, um, to legislate. And I think what that does is squeeze the innovation out of this, because I actually don't think we've we've done all the innovation necessary to make everything accessible and to try and write down the rules for accessibility at this point would be way premature but uh, uh, you know pushing forward in general is something I do. That all is right. so we're a little bit past the mark. Thank you for everybody for staying and thank you Aww. for the speakers for, for putting up with our and giving such fine talks. But thank you and John too. Thanks.